This is an overview of the readings for the seventh topic in the course on Introduction to Language Documentation and Description, this one focusing on the role of description in language documentation. Some of the ideas that are discussed are grammars and dictionaries in language documentation projects, the question of how much description and analysis should be included in documentation projects, the question of why grammatical structures should be described in the first place, and finally, the question of whether the analyses of native and non-native speakers differ. These are the readings for this week. The two initial required readings are Reesburg 2018 and Emeka 2006. Camp et al. is a chapter in the Handbook of Endangered Languages published by Oxford. This chapter gives uh, a definition of grammars of endangered languages talks about different kinds of grammars that are used for different purposes, uh, such as reference grammars versus pedagogical grammars or a grammar sketch. It looks at the organization and contents of a typical descriptive grammar. The chapter also discusses uh, decisions that need to be made in the presentation of data, such as whether data in the language should be represented phonetically or phonologically or with an orthographic script, and the question of what kind of glosses should be included. And the book ends with a hypothetical grammar outline that could be used for publishing a grammar. Julia and DeVoice in 2011 published the Handbook of Descriptive Linguistic Fieldwork, including this chapter on lexicography or dictionary making. They first discuss the difference of doing lexicography in endangered languages versus doing lexicography in one of the world's major languages. They talk about techniques for eliciting and collecting words that are available and have been used in the field. They look at different approaches to organizing lexical collection, which can be generally seen as either done in an alphabetical or a topical arrangement. They talk about techniques further for interviewing, recording, and cataloging lexical information. And finally, give an overview of some data management software that's available for lexicography. Reesburg 2018 is a short chapter on the question of how much description is necessary in a documentation project. Reesburg's uh, position is that Himmelman's 1998 position on language documentation has been misconstrued or misunderstood as promoting data gathering without any description. The impact of this misunderstanding has been an overemphasis on naturalistic data at the expense of including any elicitation in language documentation, when in fact language documentation has always been meant to include at least some elicitation, and also an unfortunate emphasis on the number of hours of recording or transcription as the sole measure of the quality of a language documentation pro pro project without taking into account how much description has been done in the project. Reesburg views language documentation as challenging and critiquing practices in language description rather than ignoring language description. For one, language documentation challenges the view that describing a language is done only in terms of the abstract rules of the grammar and instead proposes that documentation should include all of the linguistic practices, including the grammar. Language documentation also promotes the idea of sharing primary data, allowing replicability or transparency in where the data comes from that's used in analysis in ways that are not standard practice in descriptive linguistics still today. On the side effects of this misunderstanding of language documentation, Reesburg writes, what seems to receive less attention is a rather paradoxical development that due to the very success of establishing language documentation as a discipline, it has lost its descriptive component, which was always supposed to be, and I believe should be, an important and substantial part of it. Himmelman addressed the question of the relationship between language documentation and language description in his own way in this 2012 article in Language Documentation and Conservation. Himmelman starts by looking at three categories of data from historical linguistics, raw data, primary data, and structural data and translates these terms into language documentation and description as the raw data being the recordings or observations that are made, 
the primary data being the transcriptions of these recordings and any annotations or the notes that are made about observations, and the structural data being descriptive statements or generalizations, uh, such as such and such a word has such and such a meaning, a word occurs in a certain number of frequency, a certain rule is used in the syntax, etc. And Himmelman's point is that language documentation and language, document, language description necessarily overlap at the point of primary data. This is because language documentation is concerned with the creation of primary data, and the way that primary data is created is informed by structural analyses, at least to some degree. And language description is concerned with looking at the primary data and figuring out what kind of generalizations or structural data can be created out of it. Himmelman makes three further points on the tension between the goals of language documentation and language description. First is point that there may be many ideals, but resources are limited, and so priorities must be made in terms of where those resources are spent. Himmelman's position is that linguists should do what they can to meet the needs and wishes of the speech community within their skills, needs, and interests. In other words, linguists can pursue what uh, parts of description are within their interests, but should still keep in mind how that meets the needs and wishes of the speech community. Second, on the question of how much elicitation should be done versus collecting natural discourse, Hillman continues to emphasize the importance of natural discourse, but does point out that some elicitation is necessary and that the problems that are known to occur with eliciting data could be mitigated by involving multiple speakers in elicitation sessions or eliciting the same data from multiple speakers. On the question of how much description should be done and whether writing an entire reference grammar is necessary for a language documentation project, Himmelman still questions whether this is a wise use of resources and instead wants linguists to consider whether they've done enough analysis to allow access to the materials for future linguists or future other speakers of the language who will want to access the material, but this may not always include a reference grammar. On this relationship between documentation and description, Himmelman writes, documentary linguistics is primarily concerned with raw and primary data and their interrelationships, including issues such as the best way for capturing and archiving raw data, transcription, native speaker, translation, etc. Descriptive linguistics, on the other hand, deals with primary and structural data and their interrelationships, i.e. primarily with the question of how valid descriptive generalizations can be derived from a set of primary data. And on how much description should be done in a language documentation project, Himmelman writes, if one takes seriously the position that description has a subsidiary function in documentation, it requires us to scrutinize established descriptive formats, such as reference grammars, asking whether they serve this function in the best possible way. Next reading is a chapter from the Oxford Handbook of Linguistic Typology by Epps. Epps' chapter is on the relationship between language documentation, including description, and linguistic typology. And the position is that these two subfields are in a symbiotic or mutually benefiting relationship. And this is especially the case because in typology, rarely are universal statements made, but rather cross-linguistic tendencies or generalizations are made. And in order to make such cross-linguistic generalizations, typologists need extensive records of diverse languages from all over the world, all kinds of different families, and all kinds of different locations and contact situations. Epps gives several examples of cases where proposed universals of language have been disproven by language documentation projects around the world and points out that the language documentation approach is particularly necessary for certain kinds of data that are hard to elicit and also for capturing variation in a language from speaker to speaker or dialect to dialect or context to context. On the other hand, language documenters and describers also benefit from typology because the typological work that is done helps provide categories, concepts, or meta-language for representing a language in a description. Epps writes, 
It is the documentation of individual languages and the attention to specific features of these languages that enable typologists and other linguists to shape our definition of human language. Moreover, many of these data come from endangered languages, a fact which underscores the importance of recording these languages as quickly and as thoroughly as possible, and where possible, helping to revitalize them. Immelman, in this 2016 paper, makes similar points about the relationship between language documentation and typology. Again, repeating the point that language documentation is the primary data for typology, but also pointing out that typological work has developed questionnaires and stimulus toolkits, which also help to enrich language documentation projects. And finally points out that typologists and language documenters have a shared need to advocate for the value of linguistic diversity in, to the wider public. Milman writes about the reason for language documentation. Perhaps the most basic point in this regard is the fact that typology provides a raison d'etre for language documentation. One of the purposes of language documentations is to serve as a primary data pool for typological inquiry. This final reading from Omeka looks at the possible differences of descriptions of language done by non-native speakers of the language versus native speakers. Omeka advocates for collaboration between non-native speakers who are linguists and linguists who are native speakers of the language. Omeka looks at this question by comparing two descriptions of his own language, Ewe, the first done by a German linguist, Westermann, in 1907, and the later work done by Anse, uh, including a 1961 grammar. Mika has several points, including that uh, non-native speakers of the language might notice distinct features that are unusual for them, which native speakers may not notice because they're so familiar with the language that these things seem commonplace. On the other hand, there may be features that native speakers are familiar with that non-native speakers never notice. Mika also says that uh, non-native speakers may be more likely to want to make generalizations about the language, which can be helpful for linguistic analysis, where non-native speakers may focus more on the particular details and may miss some generalizations that could be made about the language. Another point of Mika makes is that native speakers might be more influenced by their own dialect or idiolect, where non-native speakers may be open to seeing the variety that happens uh, in different dialects and different speakers. Here's Mika's position on who should do descriptions of languages. What kind of linguist is the best to undertake such a job? Some would say a trained native speaker linguist. Others would say a trained non-native speaker linguist. I will continue to say the real description, the optimal record of a language, is the outcome of a collaborative effort, not only between trained native and non-native linguists, but also between these linguists on the one hand and the normal speakers of the language. Here are further resources, including uh, three books discussing how grammars of languages should be put together, and one book, Pay 1997, on the work of analyzing a language for a grammatical publication.